So um, my book starts with uh, an episode that we all remember. Everyone um, here is, I think, old enough to remember where they were when they found out uh, that uh, Dominique Strauss-Kahn had been arrested in New York uh, after a, a, uh, an episode at the uh, Sofitel. Um, uh, in my book, I need to emphasize I do not provide any new revelations about uh, what actually happened in that hotel room. Uh, this is not that kind of book. Uh, but I do have um, details about the briefing paper that he was going to take with him uh, across the Atlantic to meet, he was going to meet with uh, Chancellor Merkel and uh, with the European uh, finance ministers. That was the plan. He never made it across the Atlantic, as we all know. Um, uh, so um, uh, maybe some of you would be more interested in, in, in the briefing paper than any details about what happened in the hotel room. Um, I know I was excited to get those details. But anyway, uh, the point is this was, a, this was a, obviously a big stain this episode was a big stain on the IMS image, um, but uh, and it came at a, at a very fraught uh, period in the in the eurozone crisis. But it was it was far from the only setback that the IMF uh, experienced. Um, and the reason I say that is uh, that the IMF joined rescues of the some of the crisis stricken countries, uh, despite uh, the fact that members of its staff, members of its management, members of its board had grave grave misgivings about what was what was being uh, about the approach that was being taken. It also broke its own rules, um, and it did so because uh, uh, I mean not entirely because, but uh, to a large extent because of pressure from very powerful uh, European policymakers. Uh, and some of those rescues, I, I want to emphasize, worked out quite well. Um, Ireland is perhaps the most uh, uh, stellar example of this. But all too often what happened was that debt was piled on top of debt and excessively harsh conditions were imposed on, on the countries that were stricken by crises. And, and this approach was not taken um, just because people wanted to be bloody-minded. Was, there was a legitimate fear that if this approach wasn't taken that the crisis would spread uh, around, uh, elsewhere in Europe and, and around the world. But I argue that the legitimate interest of crisis-stricken countries were sacrificed in the process, and, and that the crisis actually ended up being more prolonged, more painful, more uh, closer to a catastrophe than it ought to have been. Um, and uh, IMF economists, to their credit, saw flaws um, in in uh, in these bailouts, uh, but but they often had to yield to what was asked for in in some of the major European capitals. Now, these criticisms um, are not uh, unique. They're not novel to me. Um, uh, a lot of very prominent, esteemed um, uh, commentators, analysts, and economists were making them, and certainly among them is, is uh, Barry Eichengreen, who, whose views really heavily influenced um, uh, the way. That's another reason why I feel daunted uh, talking about my book. Um, because, uh, but um, anyway, uh, uh, but I think it's fair to say uh, that although these, uh, you know, these criticisms are they're not, they're certainly not novel. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard them before. Uh, that my book is, uh, you know, goes goes into greater detail, and sort of providing the argument and what and, and, and discussing the actual, you know, what what, what went on behind the scenes. Um, the result um, of of the IMF's uh, 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 is that the is that the IMF was laid low. In addition to Europe being laid low, uh, that's the reason for the title of my book. Um, the IMF was, was, was sapped of its most precious asset. Of course, it, one of its major assets is the money it has to lend. But its credibility as an independent neutral arbiter was, was, uh, was, was damaged, and, and that hurts its ability to fight crises in the future. Um, uh, so that ought to be concern, of concern to us all. And um, uh, the reason, again, the reason that we all ought to be worried about that is, is that you know, we all know that globalization, we've all known for, for quite a number of years that globalization has a kind of a treacherous side where money pours in to countries when markets are feeling optimistic and then suddenly uh, investors flee when, when suddenly things start going wrong. Um, and this kind of syndrome where countries needed international bailouts um, was once thought to be only uh, applicable in countries in the emerging world, countries like Mexico, Thailand, and Indonesia, and countries like that. But the Eurozone crisis showed us that really advanced countries may end up in the same predicament. And so we need, we need a muscular uh, IMF, a, a really robust institution. It's more important than ever. The IMF, after all, is the, is the institution that provides the global public good of, uh, of global financial stability. Um, so uh, I'm going to start by talking about an episode that took place in a kitchen in Davos, Switzerland, um, in January of 2010. Um, 
And this is this episode concerns the crisis in Greece. Uh, I'll be talking, limiting my, most of my comments today to to uh, Greece in the interest of time, but also because it's sort of the most salient example of of what I'm talking about. Um, and the reason that this meeting took place in a kitchen is because the three people who were taking part in it um, didn't want to be seen by all the nosy reporters like me who who hang out at the World Economic Forum at Davos. Um, so the background of this, I'm sure, is familiar to many of you. Now, I should introduce the characters who took place in this secret meeting. Uh, the, the, the guy at the top there is Dominique Strauss-Kahn. We all remember him. Uh, this is George Papandreou, who's then the Prime Minister of Greece, and George Papakonstantino, who was then the um, Finance Minister of Greece. So the background of this, again, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I, I know many of you are familiar with, but just for, for those who, who, who um, you know, may have still been in high school or something at the time. Um, uh, so Greece had borrowed. Uh, borrowed uh, its way into a very deep hole, um, uh, 300 billion euros and uh, more than 300 billion euros in debt, more than the size of the Greek economy. Um, the deficit for uh, 2009 was turning to turn out. It turned out that the Greeks had, had basically lied about the size of how how, uh, how uh, bad their their budget situation was. The ratio of debt to GDP was then it was then pegged at 115 percent. Which is high, but not you know by itself all that alarming. Uh, but it, the worry the worry was that Greece would end up in what was what economists call exploding debt dynamics, where the debt to GDP ratio would just keep rising and rising and rising to the point where the country had to default. So if you want a good analogy, think of a think of a person who has uh, you know gets over their head in credit card debt, and uh, and at the same time uh, they get laid off or they or they get a salary cut or something like that. So their debt to their income is going up and up and up. So what they do is they take out another credit card, borrow money against that to pay off the previous credit card, but things don't work out so well. So they end up with you know the debt to income going up and up and up, and eventually they have they you know they have to go bankrupt. And the worry was that if Greece did that, uh, that it would you know if it, if it defaulted on its debt, that it would it would be kicked out of the euro. Um, or would have to fall out of the euro. So Greece was doing what, what borrowers in that situation are supposed to do. They were trying to bring spending into line with income, cutting government spending, raising taxes. Um, but uh, the markets were not, basically weren't buying it. They didn't believe Greece could, could, could do enough of that. Um, and so, uh, and, they could, and the markets were, a bit, were raising higher and higher the interest rates that Greece was having to pay on its debt, which was making its debt, all those debt, that, that debt dynamics all the worse. So, um, it, so Greece had a question for, the, the Greeks here had a question for this guy. Suppose we can't borrow at any affordable rate. Now Europe at that point, the European governments at that time were saying, we're not going to lend money to Greece because we have a no bailout uh, rule in, our, in, in European Monetary Union. They later changed their mind about that. But anyway, at that, at that point, in January of 2010, they were saying no. So, okay, so will the IMF help us? That's what the IMF does for, for countries in this, sort of, in this sort of situation. And Strauss-Kahn's answer, in this, as it, and, this, and, and Papa Constantino tells this charming story of how they were talking in this kitchen. Waiters are bustling back and forth with trays, you know, because um, they're trying to have this secret meeting. And, Dav, you know, it's, like I said, I've never been to Davos, but it's, I gather it's a rather, it's a rather cramped uh, uh, place. Um, and Strauss-Kahn's answer was not very comforting. He said, well, look, first of all, Greece is going to need more money than the IMF alone can provide. And second, if Europe doesn't want the IMF involved, then, I, then it's going to be very almost impossible for me to help you because Europe has a, a very large, in fact, disproportionately large uh, control over the votes on the IMF board. So.